the issue of mass incarceration, the issue of education and the fact that in many of our schools our, our children are getting a less than full quality education because of lack of funding and other lack of resources, and the trauma that is often experienced in both those contexts because of inadequate resources and just the way the system is set up. And our speaker tonight is uh, Reverend Joanne Duval Flynn. She is the president of the NAACP for Pennsylvania, and she's going to be talking to us about a trauma-informed uh, understanding of the school to prison. Emotional psychological trauma and school performance. So, I've been doing this going on 10 years now. All right. All right, so, so I'm just going to dive right in because there is um, a relationship between school funding, and that's where policy is made, and that's the ultimate goal that we are after. You know, I'm president of the Pennsylvania State Conference of NAACP branches. I'm also the education chair, have been for going on a dozen years, for the NAACP State Conference. And here is our prison chair, Mr. Wally Smith. He's the one, stand up on he goes, he goes to see about those people who've lost their freedom. And he's been an extremely effective chair for that community. So we start, we say there's some common factors uh, that all competent children share. And uh, these are what they are, you can read. And the one that really knocks them out initially at school and gets them into the pipeline is the lack of capacity to regulate their attention, to regulate their emotions, and to regulate their behavior. That's what gets them into the discipline track. So I talk about a trauma-informed approach because we believe, given nearly a decade of research into emotional psychological trauma and the impact it has on school performance and how they eat, we believe that if schools are trauma-focused, that they will shift the use of their resources and address the emotional and psychological needs of these children, stop punishing them for being hurt, and direct them into a healing path. Uh, when the emotional and psychological needs are addressed, they can perform well in school, and their social interactions will be appropriate to common human society. So, the trauma-informed approach deals with programming, organization, the system is trauma-informed, and it understands the widespread impact of trauma and the potential paths for recovery. Now schools, universal public education most especially, is well-equipped to address this because most of the nation's children are sitting in those schools still, even now. And so a trauma-informed system recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma. And even in its staff and the families that send their children to school, a system has to recognize that. We have so many teachers who are burned out, suffering from secondary trauma because they hold the pain of groups of children. Now, I sometimes ask this, how many of you have 32 children? Okay. <laughs> Teachers have 32 children, or between 20, and, and depending on how over, over staff or over, uh, over crowded the classroom is. Can you imagine holding the emotions of up to 40 kids at a time? and especially if they're wounded. And so our teachers also, uh, they carry the secondary trauma of the children, and so this kind of a system recognizes that. And they respond by fully integrating 
their knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. And they, they try very hard not to re-traumatize children. So a child goes to school and, and goes to school in a heightened state of, say, fear. Maybe they passed, like some children I know, a dead body on the way to school. When they get to that classroom, if the system is set up to understand what it's looking at, and if the child is erratic or cannot monitor their emotions, there's a systematic approach to that that does not include sending them for discipline or calling the climate manager. Okay? So, here's what child traumatic stress is. It occurs when a child or an adolescent is exposed to an event that overwhelms their ability to cope with it. For instance, how about if there's a drug addicted set of parents or a drug addicted parent or a bipolar parent or an abusive person in the house and what if something happens in the morning before the kid goes to school? And say it's someone big beating up on someone small, be it a man to a woman, a woman to a man, an older brother. If the child can't cope with that, then they are traumatized, and that has a particular effect. Uh, if there's a threat of injury or death, physical harm, uh, it causes shock and terror and a sense of helplessness, then that child, when they get wherever, they, well, they walk around daily in an ongoing state of acute trauma. Complex trauma, when it happens, when these events happen in a system where the child is supposed to be safe, where the child is supposed to be safe, that could be wherever. It could be the home, it could be school, it could be on the way to school, any place where the child's supposed to be safe and they're being harmed is traumatized. So, we've got four common types of abuse and people frequently, frequently just think of abuse to the physical abuse and the sexual abuse. But there's also this emotional abuse or even neglect. Uh, if that child is always being talked down to, I have even, in situations, seen mothers taunting little boys, uh, teaching them to be mean, or denigrating them. Uh, it happens to little girls too, but I just recall a couple times when I was out, I saw this happening, and I have even said to them, hey look, give it to me if you don't want because he deserves to be loved. And uh, I just, I think when I did that, well, just with me now, because I'm going to stop you from doing this right here, right now. And uh, one time I was in a Home Depot, and a father was picking at this little boy in the, in the cart, mother. And I can't remember what it was, but it was frightening the child. He had a tool or something, and he was, you know, picking at him like that. The little kid was scared. Now I know when I'm looking at a scared kid because I spent 40 years with kids, you know, watching their little faces and eyes. And so I said to him, you are frightening him, please go. He said, I'm just playing. I said, it's fun to you. He's afraid. Please stop. You know what he said? He said, thank you. I want to be a good father. I just do enough. So I felt pretty good about it. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you take a chance. <laughs> Let's look at these 14 types. Um, here's what schools have to know, realize, and understand in order to move into a trauma-informed uh, condition. They have to understand if a child has diabetes or asthma, a life-threatening illness, that child lives in a state of of concern for their life. Uh, if the child's been in a serious accident, I was someplace the other day, oh, 
him at my son's house on Thanksgiving. And his prospective in-laws had come down and had a little girl uh, nine years old. She had eaten some shellfish at some point and had a severe attack. And so when she went up to the table, and her mom was telling her what was available you know, on the table, and she said, would you like some salmon? And the little girl just cringed. Now, she had a flashback to what fish had done to her. That happens in classrooms all the time. Uh, I remember working with one group of teachers, and there was a little girl who had been raped over and over again, sexually molested in the home by a family member. And he wore a particular uh, cologne. And when she went to art class, that teacher happened to wear that cologne. And it triggered flashbacks for her. And she was always, always being put out of that class for misbehavior. See, we have to know in the field of education, I, honey, I will too. <laughs> we have to know in our schools that children are sometimes responding to severe experiences. They have nothing to do with being in that room right now. Something could trigger a flashback to a highly traumatizing, terrifying event. And so we can't put these children in a punishment mode. They've got to go into a healing mode. If there's been a disaster, school violence, terrorism, Kidnapping, neglect or maltreatment, sexual abuse, you, you can see them. And here is something, if, if the community is chaotic, okay? Um, let's look at the next one. I want to point out something. See, sometimes we don't realize how many people have come to this country and the children have never known anything but war. I've had students in my own career. I remember one young girl when, when I taught sixth grade, and she was off the ground. And her grades were just awful. So her mother came in at her conference, and she said, I don't know what's wrong. She was an A student at home. Well, the child had come out of war. She had come out of a culture she was familiar with, and her native tongue. She had come into a different social context where everyone was a stranger, the culture was strange to her, and she was traumatized. Trauma is a medical condition. It is physiological and psychological and emotional. <coughs> and so, um, until school realizes that these are the children of 20, uh, 17, 2018, and the future. We're not going to be able to deal with them appropriately with the same human regard and respect they're due to. And we do put them into a disciplinary mode and suspension and expulsion. And I learned years ago when I first started working on this that some school districts, if a child had been expelled, when they, they would have to, or no, if they had been to juvenile detention, when they came back, they had to wait six weeks before the school would register them. You know, I'm thinking, what law are they following? You know, how are they getting away with this stuff? And what's a kid who's just, who, who has been expelled from society, sit back without any re-entry kind of steps. Sit home for six months? What are they going to do? You know, and so it's a system that continues to send people away again. Reject, 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 reject. Um, go back one more time. I want to say this. Separation. More than half the people who marry and have children are divorced. Those kids are bouncing around. This is not by color. This is American society. 
over 100,000 kids in this state alone have one or more or two parents incarcerated. They're greedy. They're ashamed and they're frightened. I was, I don't know, someplace. And that particular day, little, um, these two little girls' mother had gone to the school in the wrong frame of mind and ended up in jail. And these two little girls were terrified, and one of them grabbed me and she says, who's going to take care of us? This is what's going on in the minds of kids. Who's going to take care of me? You know, they don't have any income, they don't have any political power, they don't have any social capital. They depend on big people to take care of them. When they're in school, they depend on the big people at school to be safe, when many of them are not. So, how prevalent is the occurrence of trauma? Remember our hero, uh, Attorney General Holden? He went across this country and held um, conferences <coughs> in defense of children, he called. He went all the way across this country. Found out that 60% of the nation's children have experienced trauma or lived in an ongoing trauma, 60%. Now, if you look at the scores, uh, you know how we always talk about these competency scores, and 60% um, of Pennsylvania children can't meet. It's a direct reflection. So here are some risk factors. You can look at them. If you're, if you're an educator, social worker, um, a parent, a friend of children, you know. These are things that are good for you to know. Because if you see it, there's a baby in here. Uh, the photographer, the camera lady's still ran off. I have. Yeah. That baby is not broke. You know, she's not going to miss me. That baby is, what do you think that baby was made for? Somebody give me this. What was the baby made for? Oh, great. To love and be loved. We come here to be loved and to love. <laughs> and that baby's getting plenty back there tonight. I'm a little bit myself. <laughs> so, so we create these problems by our big people behavior. And you can see some. Go to the next one. Look, systemic right here. Reverend Lord prayed about this. All of these things. And here, racism. It says racism. This is a beautiful group. It is a group of all kinds of big people who care about other human beings. The cold, okay? I've known kids who didn't know. <coughs> Years ago, there was a, a, a school called the Downingtown Agricultural Industrial School. Anybody here? I would there. Okay. And so, toward the end of its time, I went out and set up a counseling program. My graduate training is in pastoral counseling. I'm a teacher, not a preacher. <laughs> so, one of the first kids I met had gone home from school one day and the apartment was empty. He sat there three days before his social worker fell. Can you imagine? His mother took one or two siblings and just disappeared. <coughs> My husband, uh, when he taught at Cheney, he had a student who was living with, he and his sister lived with his aunt. And she took on a uh, portrait. And they went home from school and she told them they couldn't stay anymore because she didn't want him. 
These traumas occur because big people hurt little people. So, you know, and, and there's even a relationship, and I can attest to some of this. When I was a young mother, uh, we moved 500 miles from where I had family. And I had the kids, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I was doing the best I could to protect them and to train them and so forth. So I sometimes made bad decisions. You know? I was sweet. And uh, this harsh and inconsistent discipline. Parenting is something we are never trained to do. We just sort of do what our parents did, do the best we can. We love them. But sometimes uh, we let something go one time, we'll giggle at something that's inappropriate sometimes, and then we'll chastise the kid for it sometimes. How crazy making is that? You know, what's right and wrong? It's okay today. Funny yesterday, I'm getting spanked today. <laughs> okay. Prioritizing a child's needs. And when we have so many young parents, and they're still in the developmental stage, and they still need, and now they've got a real living human being whose needs are supposed to come first, and they're not really mature enough to do that. So, inadequate supervision, I'm sorry, you got to watch your children, because they will make up things to do. And, and a lot of it, you know, will have them in juvie. So each year, about 17.8 million youth are exposed to domestic violence. And then after they see that, they go to school. Some people sitting in school pray their mom will get killed while they don't. So. Fifty percent or more children exposed to trauma, and they show uh, difficulties in their affect regulation. Most of you know what that means. If you're young and you haven't been in school, you might not know affect, but you're moving. You're moving. Um, their attention and concentration. He's sitting in school. You know, teachers. I'll just say fifth grade, showing you how to do long division, because that's pretty complex. <laughs> when you're 10, 11. <laughs> and, and the teacher said, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. And you're still back on divide. What does that mean? You know? um, negative self images, impulse control, aggress aggressive uh, behavior, and risk taking. Yeah. And so, trauma. I told you is a medical condition. You, these chemicals that are flowing through your brain, and um, so so what it does, it has an impact on cognitive de uh, deficits because you can't access your executive function when you're in this condition, and so that impacts long-range planning and decision making and things such as that. Anxiety impacts the brain, you have a lower memory volume. Um, stress actually can change your brain. It's hard for kids to focus, it's hard for them to pay attention, it's hard for them to remember, it's hard for them to maintain. And so they're in school and they're not performing well academically but also because their emotions are out of control and they cannot modulate, they, uh, their social interactions are frequently inappropriate. I'm finding so many different mentalities today. It seems hard. hard. It seems, it seems challenging. I don't say it's hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge.